All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to City on a Hill Church. My name is Bruce. Glad to have you here. We are excited to be a part of a new series, a short series. Uh, Danny started it last week uh, in the book of Psalms, and we get to choose Psalms that are favorites. I hope they are your favorites, too, by the time that we are done. Um, so Psalm 18, I've already given that away, is one of my favorites. We'll jump into that in a second. But what I want to do real quickly, briefly, is jump back to last week. Danny had, as he went through Psalm 1, kind of introduced the book of Psalms to us. He had this graphic on the screen. And it shows, and it's just a beautiful, it's almost like a rainbow, right, of colors. It shows the connections that are made in Scripture from the original Testament to the New Testament. And as he pointed out, you see those little lines at the bottom? So those are the links of different chapters of different books of the Bible. So you go all the way over to the left-hand side, your left-hand side, and you see Genesis. And then you go to the longest book, that's Psalm 119. And you go even farther, and you'll find Matthew, uh, not even a quarter of the whole length of that graphic. All the different connections that are made through Scripture. And I was hearing Danny uh, last week, and as I saw that graphic, something that just kept you know, banging around in my head that I just had to come back to is the significance of the unity of Scripture, how it all ties together. You see all these different connections that, as I've said many times when you read Scripture, you can't make this up. You can't, throughout all of, of the 1,400 or so years of different authors and different languages uh, in addressing the issues of the day, all contributing to, to the work of God's Word, and how God worked through that. As Scripture tells us, it's, it's the inspired Word of God. God worked through, inspired different authors to produce this. <laughs> you, can't, you can't create that on your own. And it just... This is a, a wonderful graphic example of the miracle that the Bible is. So, the other thing that's banging around my head is, what happens if you ignore the original Testament? If you say, oh, it's old, it, that, that God is angry in that part of the Bible. He's not about love. Uh, it really doesn't have anything to do with the new covenant of grace. So, we'll just kind of ignore that and go with the New Testament copy that I have and everything's good. Here's what happens when you ignore that. Okay? I drew the line right at the beginning of Matthew in the graphic. And you see some of the lines, the purplish, bluish lines, I don't know, colorblind, but the, the, some of those connections are just in, in the New Testament specific. The vast majority of those connections do what? Connect both Testaments together. If you ignore the original Testament, you don't know why we have the New Testament. It is so significant and so powerful and so necessary for us to take all of the unity of Scripture in mind as we read and as we study and even as we preach and teach. So important. I just wanted to emphasize that in a little addition to where Danny was this past week. Now, Psalm 18, I already mentioned that. Uh, it's one of my favorite psalms of my whole life. I still remember as a teenager discovering Psalm 18. And as we read uh, we started in unison, and as Sarah read part of the beginning of the psalm, the vivid imagery is awesome, is it not? I hope you paid attention to what was going on in that psalm. Now, many of us, again, Danny pointed out last week, many of us grew up not liking poetry. And I, I think it's safe to say many of us, okay? Because in school, you're forced to read poetry. You're even at some point, probably at different points in, in your what, school journey, you are actually forced to write poetry. I hated that so much. I thought about skipping school out in the country, like I could wander in a field somewhere so I could avoid having to write poetry. I hated it. Not until I was older did I discover how beautiful and how powerful poetry can be. There was something really wrong with that Iowa public education system that forced me to read poetry that I didn't like and then talk about it. I mean, what makes sense with that? Anyway, that's the past. I'm moving on. Poetry, when you, when you discover poetry that speaks to your heart and to your mind, it's like your eyes are open to a whole different world. And I hope, I hope you, even if you had bad experiences in the past, I hope you've had something like that in your life since the bad experiences. We read the beginning of Psalm 18. 
The imagery is so powerful, it's so vivid, you can picture it, right? What, what do we read this morning? The cords of death wrapped around me, dragging me down as if there's no hope, right? Complete, utter despair. The Lord hears my cry for help. And like a fire-breathing dragon, the Lord answers. But this is the good kind of dragon, okay? The, the smoke from the nostrils, the fire blowing out, and the imagery of, the, of arrows flying through heaven, through the universe, and, and the universe basically being knocked down and laid bare and everything fleeing in the presence of God who hears my cry. So he flies down from heaven, breaking through the dark skies with stunning light and fire. The Lord shoots his arrows. He scatters my enemies. The earth is laid bare before his unparalleled power and glory. And then he draws me out. Did you catch that? As he comes screaming out of heaven, he finds me and draws me out of those waters that are surrounding me and threatening my life. And he pulls me up out of those waters, rescues me, places me in a safe place. And verse 9 says this, he rescued me, why? Because he delighted in me. He sees me and he sees my peril and understands what has to be done, throws everything aside and rescues me because he delights in me. Have you ever been in a situation where you were convinced you were about to die? Let me think about it. Most of us really haven't been in that kind of peril, but maybe some of us have. I still remember, I've used this story, I don't know how many times. Everybody's heard my tornado story. I was seven, almost eight years old. But I do remember being in a Ford Galaxy 500, ripping down this gravel road, and seeing a blazing F5 tornado coming right at our car. Directly, right? As if it cut through the field, as if it was trying to take us out in particular. Focused on us. And in my little seven, eight-year-old brain, I'm seeing that thing coming at us, and I'm thinking, this is it. This is how it's going to end. Now, that sounds like overly dramatic, right? I'm a kid, right? But no, I, that went through my head. There is nowhere to hide from this storm that is blazing its way towards us right now. We are going to die. Maybe you've had a situation uh, as a child or as an adult that is a similar weight of peril, where you think that this is it, that that, that that thought actually comes to mind, and there's a, some rational kind of mental bargaining, emotional, mental thing going on, like, what am I going to do? What, how am I, what's going to happen next? Is it going to hurt when I die? You know, some of those things coming to mind. Uh, we've all seen the news with the um, hurricanes and the damage and, and the people that have been affected. Uh, one of the most dramatic images that came out of North Carolina is this one. I know it's blurry, somebody grabbed it with their phone probably in the moment, and it was, it was not so great of a picture. But this is at least one of the most dramatic images that I saw that came out of North Carolina. Eddie Hunnell is the guy that you can't see his face. He was in his place called Grassy Creek, North Carolina, for his son's wedding when he learned that there was a woman, Leslie Worth, that's the woman in the image, not just learned about her, he saw her from wherever he was at. I don't have all the details of the story, but he actually saw her and knew that she was in peril. She was in a house that was being dragged away by the power of the flooding river. The house was actually going to collapse, and it looked, it appeared, that she had no help, no hope, and the house was going to collapse on top of her. That's when this guy named Eddie decided he needed to do something. So he, for whatever reason, there was a canoe nearby on the bank. He jumps into the canoe, goes out into the river, and convinces uh, Leslie to jump out of the house because the house is about to collapse on her. She jumps into the river. He cannot get to her by the canoe. So what does any rational thinking person do in the flood? He jumps out of the canoe in order to swim to her to try, and he must have grabbed life vest, because you see that in the picture. It jumps out of his canoe, goes to her as quickly as he can. Fortunately, he had experience in his background of uh, swimming in rivers. Not everybody has that either, but apparently he knew somewhat of what he was doing. He goes to her, and he says this, he, and I quote, I had, I had told her to jump, and she did, and I could not leave her. Hunnell, a 57-year-old engineer, told the media this. 
after he actually wrapped his arms around her, they swam, floated, whatever, towards the bank and eventually got to safety. After they were safe, he told the media, I could not watch her die. Right? He had to do whatever he could in the moment, not prepared, in clothing. But here's a woman who is going to drown if I don't do something, and I could not watch her die. If there's any perfect quote, at least recently, out of the news that we could place into Scripture this morning, it's that. God Almighty sees us going down for the last time and says, because he delights in us, I cannot let this one die. I will do whatever I can and needs to be done, parting heaven itself to come and rescue you. That is the drama and the intensity and the wonder of a God who would love us that much. I could not watch her die. Why does he do that? Well, as I already read verse, nine, uh, verse 19, God delights in me. Many times, ever since I told you uh, as a teenager, loving this psalm, many times I go back to this psalm and I picture in my mind what I read and imagine God doing these things for me. How and why? Why is the question this morning? Why would he delight so much to do so much for me? I just don't, I don't understand. And, and every time I read this psalm, and, and for years when I'd read this psalm, I get through verse 19, and, and then I don't want to read farther because something in me goes, ah. Oh. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to read farther. I basically hit a brick wall when I come to verses 20 and 24. He delights in me. Why? Well, let's read it. The Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands, he rewarded me, for I have kept the ways of the Lord. And I'm not wickedly departed from my God. For all his rules were before me, and his statutes I did not put away from me. I was blameless before him, and I kept myself from my guilt. So the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his sight. The brick wall that I get to in these verses that I just read is my lack of of righteous living. I know me, and I know I'm not righteous with my lifestyle, with all of my issues that swirl in my heart and my mind. So how can the Lord deal with me according to my righteousness and things turn out good for me? How can Christ delight in me when I know my hands are so dirty? How? And that's why I hit that brick wall. I read those verses, and my initial response is, oh, how I wish that was me, right? I wish I could read that and say, yes, but I struggle with that. When I hit the wall, I don't know what to do with those verses. Now, let's consider the author for a few moments and try to get a better understanding with some more context of what's going on. The author uh, uh, in the superscript we read is King David. David, as maybe you know, if not, I'll try to bring it up to speed. David was known as a man who has a heart for God, but he didn't have clean hands either. If you know enough of the life of King David, it's hard to look at his life and say clean hands, right? After committing adultery with Bathsheba, he, had, he went the next step and had her husband killed. Adultery and murder. I don't look at that and say he's got clean hands. All his rules before me, the Lord, uh, before him, before King David, the Lord re rewarding King David according to his righteousness. David also has a pride issue. That's detailed in the account of the sinful census he took of the people in 2 Samuel chapter 24. How can David say these things that we just read and own them? How can he say them? with a straight face. So we need to know how to make sense of what's going on in this psalm. When we hit the brick wall, which perhaps you do 
as well as me, we've got to understand why and how to tear down that wall. David wrote these words of this psalm, Psalm 18. You see them uh, prior to their being adapted as Psalm 18. We find his words almost exactly the same in 2 Samuel chapter 22. And if you go back to 2 Samuel, you begin to see some more context that David is nearing the end of his life. He is looking back as, he's pen, as he pens these words. He's looking back not just at the time that he's running away from King Saul, but I believe all of these times he's, he's, he's drawing us into the perspective of his life and what has transpired between him and others and God. He's remembering, as he writes, the Lord's hand in everything he's been through. And man, has he been through a lot. If you recall any part of King David's life from childhood and forward, all the things that he's been through, he's recounting towards the end of his life how God met him in all of those places in all these various different ways. He recounts how the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies as we read the beginning of the psalm, not just King Saul. So, here are two main things that David remembers as he writes that are so important for us to be thinking about today. Number one, the Lord fights for him, waging war against the outside, the external enemies that David faces. What does the Lord do? So let me give you just a quick rundown of what's going on in the rest of the psalm. The Lord equips with strength, verse 32 and verse 39. The Lord trains his hands for war, verse 34. These verses describe absolute and total victory over the enemies, verses 39 through 42. And how the Lord delivers him and subdues his enemies, verses 43 through 45. David has known war for most of his life. Absolute uh, battle situations, so many different times he's been out and his neck is on the line. And he's been trapped in numerous times with, with no way out and, and with enemies coming in from all sides. He's been in that situation where death is knocking at the door. And what, what do I do? Where, where, where do I go? And the Lord responds and provides the way out of those dead-end situations, even though he was trapped with no hope. The Lord intervenes. The Lord delivers. David knows that it was the Lord's doing throughout the psalm. He repeats over and over again that it is God. It is the Lord who delivered him. It's not, he cannot rely on or depend on his own effort, his own skills, his own ability. It's always, always, as he repeats, the Lord who intervenes for him, and he remembers in the psalm the Lord's work. So all of these enemies from outside are crushing in, yet the Lord delivers. But there's another aspect of this psalm that we need to take notice of. The Lord fights for him, <clears throat> saving him from internal enemies. In the middle of all his war talk, and he knew war, and there's a lot of it in Psalm 18, 2 Samuel uh, chapter 22. But in the middle of that, we find these verses, verses 35 and 36. And they say this, You have given me the shield of your salvation, and your right hand supported me, and your gentleness made me great. You gave a wide place for my steps under me, and my feet did not slip. What an odd way in the midst of all this war talk for David to describe or to explain the nature of the relationship that he has with God. Your gentleness made me great. Seems like a strange way, right? To describe how God would provide in the middle of all this talk about war. How does God's gentleness make him great? Well, in the bigger context and the connection of Scripture, there's more going on than just David in this passage. There's more going on to how God provides in his gentleness. So to get yet a bigger perspective, I'm going to draw your attention, our attention, back to Isaiah chapter 63. The, the prophet Isaiah wrote a really long book, 
Okay, that's why he's called a major prophet, not a minor one. And towards the end of his book, the last four or five chapters or so, is pretty much the high point, the summary, so to speak, of all these things that have gone on that Isaiah is speaking to. He then brings a summary to bear on all of what's going on with God and Israel. And believe me, that's a lot. By the end of Isaiah's ministry, Israel's been through all sorts of difficult times. They've been through all sorts of um, tribulations and wars, and, they've, and internally, they've rejected God many times over, repeatedly. There's a cycle of brokenness and dysfunction when it comes to the spiritual relationship they have with their God. Isaiah speaks to all of those things, and in many times in the original Testament, there is judgment. There are times when God says, enough of, of your rebellion, of your sin. There are consequences. Things will happen to you. But in the midst of judgment, there's a light of hope. There are other things that God says, especially through Isaiah at this time of Israel, Israel's life and existence, that not only they need to take note of, but we need to take note of. It's how God treats his people. Now, let's read just a, a portion, one verse. Isaiah 63, 9 says this. In, in the midst of all those troubles, and many of those troubles they brought on themselves because of their own sin, God says this through his prophet. In all their affliction, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. The internal enemy that David has wrestled with, the internal enemy that Israel has wrestled with, the internal enemy that we continue to wrestle with is sin. Sometimes by commission, sometimes by omission. Sin is a rejection and a rebellion against a God in favor of some other way to make life work and have your own way. There are times that the Lord, as I mentioned, dealt severely with Israel to humble them and to bring them to repentance. But in the midst of those times, Isaiah reminds us that not only does the Lord discipline his children, he identifies with them. How? How does he... How? How and why, right? The discipline, disciplining, but also the identification with his rebellious children, even coming alongside to redeem them. The Lord God feels the affliction that Israel feels. That's what Isaiah reminds them of. He knows who you are and what you're going through and he knows your sin, he knows every part of you and all that rebellion and all that rebellious nature that you struggled with. The affliction you bring on yourself, guess what? I feel that affliction too. What? He doesn't have to, but that is a, res that is a reflection of this amazing, mind-blowing nature of the character of God that he loves us so much that even when we're rejecting him and pushing him away, he still feels that. He still loves you that much. David is aware of that. Isaiah spoke and wrote many generations after King David. But David knew that. He knew the, the, the love of God and the presence of God in his life that lifts him up, like the, like the psalm says, pulls him out of drowning in the water where there's no hope, and a whole lot of that water is due to himself and the consequences that come with that. David knows that. He remembers that as he writes and as he pictures God pulling him out of drowning, the cords of death, he knows that God knows all his heart and he does it anyway. The gentleness of God as he looks at David, as he looks at Israel, as he looks at us, means that he can extend salvation. He knows the affliction. He loves us anyway. And he walks into our lives and all the murky, muddy garbage that's there and joins us in those places 
to bring us salvation. That's what's going on in Psalm 18. Or Psalm, yeah, Psalm 18. That's what's happened in David's life. There are times of discipline and correction, but they don't stop God's gentle mercy. And that truth leads David to sing like this. Psalm 18, verse 30. This God, it's, what do I do in response to this God? Right? That's what I see behind Psalm 18. His way is perfect. It's not my way. His way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. The Lord and his way proves true. The idea behind that is a metal worker, refining fire, proving. God is at work proving himself to be true and at the same time refining and proving us finding us where we're at, joining us in the mess and the muck and the sin, being afflicted even as we are afflicted, and then becoming, through the refining, through the proving, becoming a shield for all those who take refuge in him, holding a shield before us. Sometimes that shield metaphor, uh, it, it can be tempting to take it and, and think that we're in charge of that too. He becomes a shield that is placed before us. We simply get to respond in salvation because he puts that shield there. He proves himself to be true. Has he proven himself in your life like he has to David? David wasn't just singing of his own life. I believe in Psalm 18, he's foretelling a coming that in Christ we could all know and have this personal kind of incredible salvation. Jesus came down, not blowing smoke and throwing arrows. He came down as an infant in the most humble of circumstances to be in our world, to be embedded into our neighborhood, so to speak. And then he goes to the cross in my place to forgive me and make me right before the Lord God, my affliction, due to my sin, goes on him. His work for my behalf, so I can stand today and know that I am righteous, and I do have clean hands before Jesus Christ. The Lord proves through Jesus that he's true. For all trust in Christ, he becomes a shield of salvation, protecting us from who? Outside enemies. All those who come against us, they are powerless because of Christ. All those who tempt, distract, cause frustration, come against us in any particular way. He's the victory and the victor over that. Not only the outside enemies, but the inside enemies. The doubts about our salvation and the sin that continues to cause us to stumble, the Lord deals with me according to what? My righteousness? Yes. And here's how. Romans 5, 17 through 18. For if, because of one man's trespass, that being Adam, death reigned through that one man, affecting all of us, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and, and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass, one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. Psalm 18, all of it is my psalm. And when I remember what Jesus did, through his grace imparting righteousness to me, I can go back and read those verses that used to be a brick wall, and now they are the high point. He does delight in me, because when he sees me, I have re already received righteousness as a gracious gift, and I stand before him with clean hands because of what he's done. And I can celebrate and rejoice through the whole psalm because he sees Jesus' work that is in me now. Brothers and sisters, there is a time coming when this life will end. Just this past weekend, we, we did a little quick trip, one night trip to Iowa, and went um, visited the cemetery where my parents are buried. Looked at the headstone again, haven't been there for a while. Contemplate for a little bit about their lives. Right next to them is a headstone of my dad's parents, 
My dad's dad, whom I never met, was born 1877 or something. That's my grandfather. That's how old I am, okay? Do the math right now. That's my grand... He was born 10 years after the Civil War. My grandfather. Okay. Whew, right? I never met him or, his, or my grandmother. No idea, but I do know from what, uh, from what little my dad told me of their faith in Christ. And I sure hope that they had the opportunity, as I know my dad did, towards the end of life, to look back and do what David did. Through all of those challenges, through all of the struggles, the Lord proved himself to be true. He was my shield no matter what. I could stand before him righteous without any fear of condemnation. My hands are clean because of Jesus. That is a gift that as you look back, you can celebrate no matter what went right or wrong in our lives. And there's plenty that goes wrong, right? Amen? There's plenty that we can stop and go, oh, I didn't pray for that, but, but I got it anyway. Jesus is good, and his word is true, and he's still at work. Maybe you're at a point where you've never had that moment. When you read the psalm, like, not me. Maybe this all sounds like religious gobbledygook. That could be a possibility. It's not. What we have here in Scripture is a glimpse into the glory of God and His love for us. Have you responded to it? And maybe some of us are in a place this morning where, yeah, I read those verses, and I know my hands aren't clean, and I struggle. Jesus makes you clean, not you. That's the scandal of grace. It doesn't make any sense. Quit trying to make sense of it. Just accept it today, and then tomorrow, and then the next day, you get the idea. We stand in his grace. That's the gospel goodness that does not make sense in the way that we compute things, but that's God's love for you. If you struggled with that idea of being clean before him, this, this morning, this psalm is an invitation to drop the struggle and stand behind his shield. Will you do it? Now, I don't want to sound like just another gobbledygook person. And maybe your struggle is so painful or so sharp that you really need to process some of that. Do it. What are you waiting for? There is no judgment here. As I look out, I see a whole lot of people that have been through all sorts of stuff. I'm looking at everybody, so you can't say that I picked on you. Right? Right? We are in the same boat, all drowning if it weren't for the fact that Jesus reaches down and pulls us out. Glory to God. If you struggle with that, talk to me, talk to Danny, talk to some, even before you leave today. Let's talk about that and see how and remember how God's grace is sufficient for you. Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, I love your word. I love this psalm. I love how it gives me an image of, of, of you, of a God who would delight in me because of Jesus. When you look at me, you see his righteousness, and my hands are clean. I cannot, sometimes, Lord, I mean daily, <laughs> I struggle with that. Renew our minds as those who have been saved by grace, who have responded to you, and seek salvation in the name of Jesus Christ. Remind us, Lord, refresh us in your truth. Keep refining us, Lord. Don't give up on us. Keep working in us, proving yourself to be good and to be sufficient, and increase our desire and our love for you in response. In Jesus' name, amen.